Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, my name is Eli Boyne and I am the Rare Book Library Associate here at Tulane University Special Collections, um, or as we like to call it, Tusk. And we are so excited to have three um, incredible book artists here with us today um, to speak about three of their books that we're very fortunate to have here as part of our collection. Um, they're gonna give some presentations on uh, three books, uh, one, from each, one from each book artist. Um, and then we're gonna engage in conversation, um, talking a little bit about um, why, why make artist books, um, talk about their processes, the stories that they tell and um, what artist books mean for them, mean to them. Um, so um, I will introduce our artist and thank you so much for being here and being part of this event today. Um, first, we have Elisa Banks. And Elisa Banks lives in Dallas, Texas and explores identity politics through the lenses of home, terrain and the body. Her work includes fibers, found, fibers and found materials and references traditional craft techniques such as twisting, knotting, crocheting, and sewing to create sculptural and textile-based work. Using Southern Louisiana as a point of entry, her practice investigates connections to contemporary culture and the African diaspora. Elisa's work has been exhibited in Canada, Europe, Asia, Africa, and throughout the US, and is hosted in several private and public collections including the Smithsonian Institute, the US Library of Congress, and the New York Public Library. We also have Caden Henningsen here. Caden Henningsen is a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he works on 19th century American literature, book history, and print culture as it intersects with transgender studies. He also holds an MA in Gender and Women's Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a BFA in performance art from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Caden is the proprietor and co-founder of Meanwhile Letterpress, a trans-owned letterpress collective resisting erasure through the power of print. And last, we have Sarah White. Uh, Sarah White draws from creative inspiration and from the wild industrial landscapes around New Orleans, where she works as a book and paper conservation specialist at Tulane. Sarah serves as the founding member of the Artist Book Collection at Paper Machine, and, is, and her own artist books are held by collections around the United States. Um, so thank you again so much to Sarah, Elisa, and Kaden for joining us today. And we'll go ahead and start with Elisa, and she is going to be speaking about her artist book called Yeen. Okay, let me share my screen. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that introduction, Eli, and uh, thank you everyone for, um, for joining us today. Really excited to get our conversation started, <laughs> Sarah and Kaden. But um, as Eli stated, the book that I'm um, speaking about today is called Yin. And so much of my work is, um, let's see if I get my thing on here. We're on, a, we're on a little uh, delay. But much of my work is inspired by actual people, um, experiences, or events. And I'm really drawn to those that um, are outside of mainstream um, and in some way relate to broader themes. So um, both of my parents, let's see if I go back here, but it um, looks like my, my screen doesn't want to go back. Oh, here we go. So both of my parents and my extended family are from Southern Louisiana. And although I grew up in a military family and didn't live in the area, save one year, um, that, that, that area seems to be my kind of my spiritual home, even though I do have uh, folks outside of that area, uh, particularly in the New Orleans uh, area as well. Uh, but this is the area that I keep coming to back, coming back to over and over again in my work. So this is Ying, and it's a house-shaped box that features an image of a now dilapidated shotgun style cottage. And it was one of the homes that my dad lived in as a child. You can see some um, stuff, uh, kind of garbage and, and whatnot in there. Because when I took the, this photograph at the time, it had been abandoned for quite a number of years. 
So the house, particularly the, the shotgun and Creole cottage style um, houses are recurrent images in my work. So the top of Yin lifts off and it'll reveal a base with a backyard view. And on the base also is an accordion book that's surrounded by a necklace that's fashioned, that's fastened to the base. So Yin was the daughter and wife of sharecroppers and was larger than life to those who live with, who were within her circle, but unknown and invisible outside of it. And this book is a tribute to women, particularly those in rural areas who like her, like Yin, were invisible uh, in main, within mainstream society. So the backyard, you can kind of see it on the, in the image to the right has an ancient tree with a chicken coop and there's some chickens there. And I really don't know why that ladder is there against the tree. Maybe it's to gather moss uh, hanging from it. And the moss was used for uh, mattresses and, and other types of things. Um, but I do like the potential of the ladder as a symbol. And whenever I'm making a piece, I always find that there's some unexpected gift. Um, and it, I, I'm not always aware of it even as I'm constructing it. I'm more, more likely to notice these things after the fact. But um, I, I call them gifts and I'm, I usually <laughs> just those, those little things that you really can't plan every single thing in a piece, but sometimes things just happen and they happen uh, in good ways. And so to the right, to the left, you'll see the accordion closed and then that um, the necklace that surrounds it. And that necklace is, um, it has all types of goodies in it. It has paper and gemstones and hair, uh, metal, thread, um, and little medallions. And it's, it's asymmetrical and coded and it's deliberate, but off kilter. And it's a little improvisational um, as well. So the top of the accordion lifts up and Underneath, in the back of the cover, is just a, a scene of uh, cotton, cotton balls. And um, inside, there's a poem uh, or text, and I'll read the text to you. Uh, Severine, dark, curvy, competent. A woman of her figure would likely be invisible or looked upon with disdain outside of her neighborhood, though she rarely ventured that far. At home, her tongue offered sparks and laughter. Her hands were generous. She was a good cook and kept a tidy house. Her spirit would not be broken, not by poverty, the overseer, or her husband's hand. She worked the fields and could not sew, but her boys could. She birthed eight in the span of 20 years and was widowed early when her youngest was three. She liked parties, even with her sons. This last part was taboo in her country town. She was blunt and opinionated, though not always factual and was loud but tender when the situation called for it. Her boys adored her, Ying. She loved that Jimmy Ling, the flashy jewelry that moved as she did. It was her signature and she wore it proudly. Always adorned, her selections ranged from the conventional metals to thread, depending on her circumstances. And no matter the material, there was always movement, her fringe. I will stop the share and that is Jean. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, next we'll have Caden, Caden Henningsen, and he'll be presenting his work, uh, Marianne Waters is a Free Black Woman. Thank you so much uh, for um, putting this together, Eli, and I'm really excited to be in conversation with Elisa and um, Sarah and and uh, people who have joined us. Um, so uh, my artist book, Marianne Waters is a Free Black Woman, uh, came out of some of my uh, a research um, in a graduate seminar on uh, 19th century uh, Black print culture. Uh, and so I am used to looking at a lot of newspapers a lot, um, and a lot of print material. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, for this book was working with um, a pickup notice, which I'll, I'll get to in a, in a minute, 
um, that was the pickup notice is a sort of form of um, slaving literature uh, used in newspapers, um, and I'll and I'll talk more about that in a minute. In a minute, but first, before I get into the actual mechanics of the book, I also want to um, briefly talk about um, some of the artists and scholars whose work I'm drawing on um, and informs sort of my approach to making this book. Um, first is Glenn Ligon. Uh, his piece, I Feel Most Colored, um, When Thrown Against a Sharp White Background. The um, accumulation of um, ink as it smears across the page as he continues this phrase using a stencil and the sort of overlapping and sort of accumulation and how sort of breaks down through a kind of accumulation. Um, and so, and in and, and other uh, pieces, Glenn Ligon has also worked with um, a particularly runaway fugitive slave notices, um, another kind of slaving literature. And so his work has been um, all sort of on the forefront for me. And then the other um, other artist is poet Emna Borse Philip uh, and her book Zong, which uh, takes the archives of the slave ship Zong um, and pulls out these poems from them. And so we have this uh, Zong number one poem that um, gestures towards the waves of the Middle Passage when the poem is read out loud, gestures towards the sound of drowning. Um, uh, and it's just a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful uh, collection of poems. And so I was thinking uh, visually um, along the lines of uh, some of the work that Glenn Ligon is doing and then also visually, especially thinking with M. de Borse Philip. Um, and then I was also thinking about the um, theoretical work of Christina Sharp. Uh, who in uh, her more recent work in The Wake on Blackness and Being theorizes a kind of mode of engaging in the world is what she calls wake work, where she calls it um, a, a means of understanding how slavery's violences emerge within the contemporary conditions of spatial, legal, psychic, material, and other dimensions of Black non-being as well as in black modes of resistance. And I'm really interested in the way that she is thinking about um, modes of resistance. And in particular, uh, I use her um, approach of black redaction as a mode of seeing and reading otherwise that makes visible something in excess of what is caught in the frame. Uh, so I uh, am visually thinking about the wake work that um, uh, Phillips is doing in Zong, the, re the visual referencing of the wave, the waves of uh, the Middle Passage and the legacy of slavery. Uh, and then thinking about Christina Sharp's uh, process of uh, redaction and what it means to redact texts in order to make um, what is what she calls something in excess that is caught in the, the frame of, of a text. Um, so I was working with uh, this uh, pickup notice um, from the Daily National Intelligencer uh, in 1851 uh, that is about this figure, Mary Ann Waters. Um, so was committed to the jail of Baltimore City County on the 23rd day of September 1851 by DC H. Bordley Esquire, Justice of the Peace of the State of Maryland and for the city of Baltimore as a runaway, a Negro man who calls himself Marion Waters, about 28 years of age, five feet, two and a half inches high, stout built, very black complexion, and has a scar on his left ear. Said Negro had on, when committed, a dark figure, uh, Mousseline Delane dress, blue velvet, mantilla, white satin bonnet, and figured scarf says he is free, was born in Elk Ridge, and has been hiring out in the city of Baltimore as a woman for the last three years. Um, the owner, and then there's a sort of plea for the owner to come and collect uh, Mary Ann Waters. And so I'm thinking with Christina Sharp about the way that a pickup notice is a kind of um, disciplinary apparatus, a way that is trying to fix uh, Mary Ann Waters um, in very particular ways, um, both as uh, someone who's enslaved, uh, as a man, um, 
and what I'm trying to do through black redaction is remove and, and redact the text that actually shows the way that the pickup notice as a disciplinary apparatus tries to confine her. So the redaction op operates as a way to, as a way of seeing what is in excess of the, um, uh, the pickup notice. And so what I did for the book is I, um, I hand set the, the text of the notice and then um, over the course of printing it, I slowly removed uh, bits of text um, as a sort of form of uh, redaction. I'm thinking about the way that in the 19th century print is assumed to be fixed and stable, uh, but we know that that is not true and one way is mid print, I'm removing uh, text. And so what happens is I'm left then with a book that is a flip book that over the course of the book that as you flip it, the text slowly um, disappears. Uh, it disappears in a wave uh, like movement that then leaves behind the sort of what is in excess of the frame, which is what Marianne Waters uh, perhaps thought of herself. Uh, and I feel like I've always got to point this out. Um, I'm gonna get my laser pointer, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few moves, uh, you know, in the original ad, it says, calls himself Marianne Waters, but over the course of the flip book, himself becomes the neutral here self, H-I-R, and then eventually herself. And then uh, the word black, uh, isn't in that location, and I have to slowly pull letters from around uh, and resituate them in order to get uh, the text. Um, and so I will leave it at that and uh, hand it on over to Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaden. Um, it's wonderful to hear um, the stories from all of you about your processes and, and all the elements that go into your books. Um, Sarah, if you'd like to present your book, Riverine. Sure, thanks. Thank you both so much for those presentations. They were both really moving and um, I'm honored to be included on this panel. Thanks, Eli and Tusk. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about my book, uh, Riverine, which I completed in 2016 while finishing up an MFA in book arts at the University of Alabama. So that curriculum and that program really allowed me to dive deeply into the traditions of hand book binding. So um, I was learning things like hand paper making, letterpress printing, and um, sewing and constructing various book structures. All of, and all of those elements kind of go into this particular book, which was my thesis project. So the book is seen here in printed sheets before it was trimmed down and assembled into its final form. Um, I wanna jump into the content of the book. This book was inspired by a landscape in New Orleans called The Batcher. Uh, this particular area is located in the uptown Riverbend neighborhood of New Orleans, um, and the term batcher is used for the area between the levee and the Mississippi River, or really any river. Um, so it's sometimes completely submerged by the river and sometimes it's dry depending on the seasons. And the interesting thing about this particular location is that there are 12 homes that exist here on stilts, um, and it's always been since I was introduced to it and I wanted to learn more about this place and in doing some research I discovered that the current uh, community is a vestige of much larger communities that existed on the Orleans Parish side of the Batcher prior to the 1950s. Um, so this is an image of the book in its constructed form so it's an accordion structure with stone pamphlets in the the inner or valley folds of the accordion. And I used line drawings and photographs throughout to illustrate its history. And with the text, I wanted to have kind of a fragmented essay um, printed tr traditionally on the page, which is what you see um, printed in the darker ink here. And then I also wanted to have this running thread of a more poetic text that speaks to the experience of the place. And that's printed in that sort of orangey red ink there. Um, getting back into the history, this is an image on the right. It's a bird's eye view of one of the communities that existed in the late 1940s, early 1950s on the Orleans Parish side. And I, I learned that 
there was a union that had formed around that time called the Badger Dwellers Association. And these people were organizing against um, what was then the Orleans Levy Board, which was sort of the overseeing entity at the time. Um, they were fighting multiple eviction notices um, and threats of the destruction of their homes. So they lived here totally legally, but under the condition that if the levy needed to be expanded or maintained, they would be forced to leave. Um, so this on the left is a quote in the book uh, from one of the members of the Batcher Dwellers Association that I thought evoked um, the, uh, the feeling of living there very well. These are a couple of documents from a small archive that exists at Tulane devoted to the Batcher Dwellers Association. Um, I, I found that these folks actually printed their own self-run publication called These Were Our Homes. This was a pamphlet that they printed and distributed around town for a dollar a piece in order to spread the word, um, shine a light on what was happening to, to their community. Um, it not only showed you know, what the Orleans Levy Board was, was doing and threatening, but it also, um, some of the inner spreads, there are collage images of some of the people who live there and provide kind of a, a profile of of the community members because prior to this, really the only way that um, that this situation got any publication was in the newspaper. And these people were often depicted as sort of a tourist attraction or just often using dehumanizing language. So um, I really wanted to incorporate the voices of this community into my book as sort of the, the most important thread. Um, and I also wanted to weave in current um, experiences of the Batcher, my own and current residents. So this is my, my friend, Megan Fry, who has lived on the Batcher for nearly 40 years. Um, I should say he's actually an expert on the history and he's about to um, release his own book, which I can put in the chat later if anyone is interested um, about the Batcher and its history. But uh, spending time with him there at his home and in the river um, really informed the poetic writing for my book. So this is a spread that has layered pages that are meant to give, take, and reveal um, information as they are flipped through. And with this particular structure, I just wanted to give a sense of the, the way the water rises and falls and the sense of palpable change that exists on the Batcher. This is um, just a brief illustration of how letterpress printing can work with photopolymer plates. So the top left is an image I took of this looming um, electrical tower that stands on the Batcher and has a really strong presence there. Uh, so I created this line drawing that suggests the lines of the tower. And then I was able to create a photopolymer plate that was printed on a Vander Cook press. And you can see it here printed across the book in these muted tones. This is a spread that pops up uh, and is intended, intended to indicate kind of a house shape. Um, when it's flipped down, it's speaking to kind of the paradox of living on high and how that the meaning of that changes depending on who and where you are. And it opens and the text um, on the inside speaks to the Mississippi River and the 31 states that it touches before reaching New Orleans. And as a result, the um, the man-made and household items that can wash up on shore. And there's kind of an imaginary running list of items running down the side of the page. So this is the, uh, the book as a whole, and I'll end with this slide. Um, with this book, I was just trying to, um, to capture kind of the feeling of living in between spaces um, on a place that's always in flux and kind of defying boundaries and definition. Um, I chose the accordion structure so that it would flex within the viewer's hands to reinforce that sort of uh, riverine feeling. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there and I'm looking forward to complete, uh, continuing the discussion with you all. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you so much um, to all three of you. It's really um, incredible to be able to see um, your books so closely in this way and to hear directly from from your uh your your mouth like how how you made them and all the layers of research that went into making um these books so i'm going to quickly um do some little formatting matting changes here so we can make sure that we can see our three um artists in conversation um 
I'm going to kick us off with a question, um, but I'll also be checking the chat. So please, if anyone um, watching or listening has any questions for our artists, please feel free to pop them into the chat and I will try to incorporate them into the conversation here. Um, but again, as I said, it's really just incredible to see um, the ways that you each approach making your artwork um, and the stories that you're able to tell in these many different layers in your books. Um, so maybe you could give us a bit of background um, and tell us a little bit about when you first started making artist books and what drew them to you as a medium. Well. I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, so I started off as a painter and um, I just, it just so happened that I took a printmaking class and I needed to get some paper for the class. And there was a um, notice for a workshop that says, want to make a book? And I thought, hmm, make a book. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> so it was, it was just something I never thought about making, I didn't even know that artist books existed. And the books that we made in the workshop were very, uh, very basic, like accordion and pamphlet style books. So very much a book structure. And it wasn't until uh, maybe a couple of years later that I was actually introduced to the artist book format. And I, I'm, really, um, I'm really drawn to it because I think of pretty much everything as a book and everything can be um, discussed, addressed, introduced um, in, a, in a book format, it, visited in a book format. And the book format can be so many things. And I love playing around with the possibilities of how information can be presented in a way that, um, that maybe mimics or touches upon a book, but not necessarily in, in a traditional book format. Um, I can go next. I, um, I got into bookmaking through, um, I guess after college, I, I went to school at Loyola University for um, studio art. And one of my teachers there, Caroline Schley, kind of introduced me to this idea of artist books, I guess, but I didn't quite have the language for it. But I was often incorporating text into the, the pieces that I was making, and kind of went in a printmaking route. And then um, after college, I started working in independent bookshops in New Orleans and getting more and more interested in letterpress printmaking. Started working with a local printer, John Fitzgerald, and um, tabling at the New Orleans Book Fair. And uh, eventually, after a few years of getting really interested in zine culture and community, you know, literature culture, um, I discovered the Paper and Book Intensive, which is a, a yearly retreat that happens amongst librarians and bookmakers um, up in Michigan and I got a scholarship to go and that's where I really discovered what artist books were and um, saw a talk by Sarah Bryant who's now one of my favorite book artists and and then I applied for grad school after that. Um, I feel like my uh, my story with book arts has been very sort of meandering. Um, I when I started thinking about this question, it um, it wasn't until like the middle of the night that I remembered that my BFA thesis back in two thousand one that I had made uh, made some books as part of that thesis. Um, they were just little. Um, little workbooks, part of the thesis was I was uh, doing a performance where I was assimilating from being left-handed to right-handed. And so I had these workbooks to teach myself how to write with my right hand. Um, but book arts came in and out of view for me right out of college. I um, uh, managed, luckily, I think, to get a job at the Newberry Library. Uh, and so I became familiar with the Wien collection um, on the history of printing and sort of like working with their, their files and collections of like fine, fine letterpress printing. What I, I'm critical of the fine letterpress printing, but the fine letterpress printing. Um, and so had always been uh, from the Newberry, I worked in um, the Newberry and then at the Huntington Library in California for 10 years. And so I'd always been around books in some way and thinking about books. 
Um, and also as in, in that history, I was coming out and figuring out my queerness and understanding my queerness and my identity as a trans person through other people's reading of me. And so I had been thinking about, um, you, thinking a lot about how the body is a book and um, questions around, you know, what exactly constitutes a book and what are the sort of like things that, what are the like norms or conventions of what a book is or can be. Um, and so I started, uh, my research thinks about those questions, like what, what are the norms of a book? Um, how can we push against those norms? I think artist books for me is one way that I can sort of resist traditional modes of scholarship. Um, and the, um, my book, Marianne Waters, became a solution to a problem. I was trying to think through a question about the relationship between ideas about gender and race being fixed and ideas about print being fixed in the 19th century. And I needed a way to work through how to write about this question. And so the, the artist book format became a way to deal with um, a, an issue that I was having in my scholarship. Um, and artist books for me have always been a way to sort of push back and resist sort of like the normative sort of aspects of, of books, um, right? I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, Kaden, because I think that one thing that always makes me so excited about artist books is the so many different forms that they can take. And just looking at the three of your books today, we have, so we have one panel here and for our participants, participants, in case you aren't um, looking at the Zoom panel this way, it's great to look at it through the speaker view because then you can see our three speakers and we have something here where we can actually um, move the books and look at them. Um, and so here we have Cadence book where you can see how it works as a flip book. And um, just through flipping the pages has this act of, um, as he noted in his presentation, like transformation and liberation for Marianne Waters. Um, and so, and then in Sarah's book, we see, um, as she referenced things like um, the, the roof lines of houses or levees, and um, Elisa's books is, is shaped like a house, but it also has the air of like a jewelry box. So could you guys talk a little bit about kind of the structural elements of your book and why, um, why you choose to use those kinds of structures and what they can add to your stories that you're telling? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Um, in, in my book, I, um, I decided to use this sort of hexagonal shape. It's kind of a repeating motif throughout. Um, it, it happens on the cover and then it happens again in um, line drawings later on and then in the pop-up that I showed. And uh, I was drawn to that shape because anytime I looked up a map of this area, uh, the levee is always depicted as this like very clean lined hexagon. And you know, it also, also called to mind uh, rooftop. So I think um, I was lucky in that this location and this landscape and this history was just really fertile with um, metaphor. Um, these things kept revealing themselves to me that were sort of reflecting one another if that makes sense. And, and that was really fun to work with visually. I felt like there was a lot I could do with layering paper and um, showing you some content and, and forcing you to kind of pace yourself to, to discover, you know, what was underneath or what was hiding behind the next page. So I have a question. Um, Sarah, on your, like on that page down there, is, there's kind of a green there are some layers of green. Mm -hmm. are, are those like different pieces of paper? Is that part of the print process as well? Because there's layering, not yes. just in the unfolding, but the layering of the text and then those, those bands of, of color down there. I really wanted to have um, some kind of wash kind of you know flowing throughout the book. And I, I tried different techniques and a few just didn't work out. And I ended up um, using large, linoleum pieces that I had just cut into shapes and then layered on top of one another. Just to show that rising water, falling water. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have some pages kind of appear dry and others appear damp. Mm -hmm. 
Aiden, and um, I was really, i sorry. I just wanted to tell you that I was really excited to see your letterpress process because I don't think that I knew that it was handset type before. And that was super exciting to me to see that it was a physical like analog um, process for you. And can you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, um, it took for, it took me a long time to print it because it was, took me forever to hand set the, the first set block of type, the first form of type, and then slowly remove the type, but then figure out how and where to move the type was a challenge. I knew that I wanted, in order to sort of like convey what I wanted to convey through this process of um, what Sharp is calling black redaction, I knew that I wanted people to be able to move through the book slowly, but also in order to really see the movement that's happening to be able to move through it quickly as well. And so the flip book made the most sense to me that there you can just because of the, um, you know, not technically perfect printing. I was using uh, a line of scribe. I didn't want to tie up the um, Vander Cooks from other students because it was, I think like two months I had this type like locked into the line of scribe and no one else could use it. Um, but in order to get a print, um, uh, I had to really apply some pressure. And so the, the print does sort of cut through in some areas to the back. I broke some type in the process through constant mm -hmm. um, use. Uh, so there's something, even the kind of like what's in the wake, I guess, of the, um, the process of setting the type and printing it is the sort of like the damage type that can't be reused to, to recreate this particular text. And so, um, is redaction sort of a mode of removing type and also damaging the type to prevent it from being used again um, in those ways. Um, but the flipbook format seemed like the most logical sense um, oh, yeah. for dealing with this issue, yeah. Yeah, I like the way that that type in some ways limits the, the ad. Exactly. It's not, it wasn't perfect and- It looks intentional, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I, I just think the flip book was perfect for this for this content. Mm -hmm. I love the gift too. It feels like there are so many directions you can go with this book, the, mm -hmm. the digital version, the physical <laughs> version. I feel yeah. like you could also make like a um, deluxe box with your type that's been destroyed, you know, that- Yeah, <laughs> there is, you know, this, this book was just a small edition of five plus the artist proof, just because of how labor intensive it was. Um, and I've been reluctant to reprint it because the only press I have right now is um, a Chandler and Price and the dealing with taking a chase on and off the press with when you're constantly removing type just feels like a big mess. Um, but I will have an opportunity to um, uh, start reprinting it with a Washington hand press. Um, and so I'm starting to think about what I learned from making this to um, how it can evolve. The GIF is its own thing. I don't even know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Elisa, could you talk a little bit about you, your, the, your use of textiles and the different materials that you have um, as part of your, your necklace here in me? Yes, so um, first of all, the piece itself, I'm very interested in, in sculptural type work. And so many of my books have a, a sculptural aspect, aspect and even the performance of taking the cover off of the box and then revealing underneath. I like that reveal <laughs> and, the, and the movement. But um, the necklace itself outside of what it, you know, the relationship of Yin's love for wearing jewelry in spite of, you know, working, you know, doing unglamorous work that you necessarily wouldn't have to have jewelry on wear it to wear, um, but that she took that type of care of herself. Um, I also, the necklace itself is, is kind of coated. So in that area of where, where she's from, it's pri or was primarily Catholic, I'm not sure if it still is or not, although I suspect it probably is. Um, so there's kind of like references to that um, in the, the kind of the code work of the beads 
Um, then there's other things like hair and calorie shells in there as well. So there's, there's kind of a mix of, of items and I wanted it to reflect how um, that, you know, spirituality or religion um, is kind of part of the cultural fabric, even though it may not be in a, in a particular person's personal belief system that is, is just part of the culture. And so I felt that using kind of a, a necklace made out of different types of materials would work. And I often do use um, some type of hand stitching. In this case, it was crochet um, in my pieces because those that are um, from that place or, or have some touch upon that part of, the, of, of uh, Louisiana, in my family, there was a lot of creative, creative um, output as far as needlework and you know quilting, crochet, tatting, that, that type of thing. So I usually include something of that in it. I'm also really interested in using things that are not traditionally thought of as book material. Um, although books use cloth, mm -hmm. <laughs> paper, which could be made out of cotton. Um, I, I'm always playing with the fact that, you know, there's the notion of things that aren't written down in a historical record as how, how authentic is that? But then when I think about a, a book based on history, a lot of times that might be oral communication that's transferred into text. And so in that case, really the book itself is the word, which is sound. And if sound can be a book, what else can be a book? Mm -hmm. And so I'm always playing with that. If you can use, if you can use paper to, to put words on it, couldn't you do the same thing with cloth when they're both made out of cotton? And so those are the kind of things that I play with. Um, and as far as the particular shape of, of this piece, is just to mimic the house. You see the house, I would see these houses um, from the highway and it's like they're completely foreign objects. <laughs> I've never, not ha ever having been in one, what is it like to live, you know, in the middle of a field or to the back of a field in one of these houses? And so I just wanted to bring the house structure a little closer. Thank you. Elisa, I really love what you did with color in this book. Um, I love like the regal purple cloth. And it's interesting to me that you chose the, the black and white images or maybe just the one image is black and white. Yeah, so um, it's interesting you add, spoke of, uh, mentioned the color, but yeah, I mean, so Yin is like the queen of her world, right? <laughs> And so maybe uh, maybe that's just that's just kind of what what the color of purple is. But the and the black and white as far as the the cotton there. Just looking at a lot of old black and white pictures. Even though I don't, um, you know, I do a lot of research when I when I do the work when I make my work, and so I'm always looking through writing or pictures, a lot of times are really old pictures. And so I kind of just wanted to have a little nod to that. Thanks did for you, noticing that though. Did you see how many of these you made? Is it a one of a kind? Yeah, this one is unique. Okay. Most of my work is either unique or a small, uh, small edition. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we do have one question in the chat. And that says, uh, thank you all so much. I would love to know how you envision your books being used in the classroom or in an instructional context. What conversations do you hope they inspire? What do you hope students learn or take away? Thanks again. I think, um, I think artist books are in general are just great for, um, for most disciplines because they, Kind of encapsulate critical thinking like you're literally required to look at something from different angles and slow down and um and i think that's important in any discipline and i don't know what do you guys think well 
I think so too. Um, for me, artist books kind of bring things to life. Um, reading about something on a flat page is so much different from the aspects of, of, of experiencing an artist book. Um, even if it's something that you, you do flip through, you're flipping through it. You're not reading in it the same way as a book. And like in, in Sarah's work, you're, you're flipping things open. In Cadence, you're flipping the book. Um, the placement of the text, I think that does something different to your mind when you're reading text that's curvy or you know disjointed in some way versus reading it straight through. And I, I also think that you can look at an artist book from various disciplines. For Yin, for example, there's a structure of the house. And so someone who's interested in houses or interiors, I think that they, that might give them something different than say someone who's looking at, um, oh, I don't know, uh, sociology or something. I was throwing something out there. But I, I think that there's always something different if it reaches people on multiple levels and artist books can reach you wherever you are and show you something that maybe you aren't really um have, are not really familiar with mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think you were all touching on the sort of like tactile sort of haptic quality i mean risk codex regular codex books books are that way also but you're right that there's a way that we're forced to engage with artist books in ways that we don't typically engage with books. And both the structure of the artist book and its content lend the book to be um, used in different sorts of classrooms. So I could see, um, you know, Elisa, like you were saying, like if it's a class that's on like housing in some way, um, instead of looking at a bunch of sort of like architecture drawings of houses, and then all of a sudden there's this artist book in the shape of a house, it might challenge what it is we think of when we think of a, of a house, um, right? Um, like, and there's also with, um, with Sarah's work, like what would it mean in a class on housing to have Sarah's book and Elisa's book as part of a collection of materials that people are looking at when thinking about housing um, in that way. Um, so, you know, or they could just also be in classes that are about the history of the book and how do these books actually challenge what it is we think of when we think of a book. Um, so there's like so many ways that you could go with an artist book that sometimes you as much as I love the Codex book, you know, you like, you can't, it's just, and I find, I mean, I take my students to special collections, rare books all the time at the University of Illinois, and they like the books okay, but they really love things like um, the sort of like double folio newspapers that are too big to hold that open up this way and then open up that way. And they're just kind of like, um, astonished by that. Um, and so it's always about what kind of things can you bring into the classroom that disrupt whatever preconceived ideas they have. So my book disrupts perhaps preconceived ideas of what a, a book is and can do, but also preconceived ideas about both print and race and gender um, that they might not get through a standard sort of textbook. Um, and I, I really like that, um, what you said about even the, the traditional codex is performative in some way, whether you're flipping through the pages or the story that's written down takes you places. Mm -hmm. I think that's performative as well. And what I'm really interested in now is how many ways in which um, information can be shared, um, book format, I mean, even, even something that's not tactile, you know, like your digital flip book. Um, <laughs> that's, one, that's one way of experiencing it. What if the book were smell? You know, what if it were um, sound? I think those kind of things are really, um, are really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. 
I find it interesting too that we all, I think, draw from archives and historical records to produce our books. So I think any class that is trying to encourage, you know, using the library's resources would benefit from looking at artist books. Yeah, when I think of the when I think of the artists, the book artists whose work I like, I find that so many of them are working with archival material um, and are doing different modes of research, whether it's um, sort of like oral histories, I know, um, Elisa, you've talked about, um, or working with the, the Badger archives at Tulane, like there, the process is that there's a much more, um, it's, a, it's a much bigger process of um, what goes into constructing a book and archives, um, whatever sort of shape archives take, right? Or um, smell, right? That those become um, resources for, uh, for the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Kind of gives voice to the archives and make them come alive in a way. So <laughs> that box that, that you had, Sarah, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's alive now. <laughs> it's not just a box, right? <laughs> and Caden, yours is, is not just like, um, you know, a newspaper article, you know, it's more, it's more than that. And, you know, words, words just kind of come alive, I think. And they, and they connect us to things like how many people are now going to seek out the Bachelor material mm -hmm. at now because of, because of the artist book. And one of my experiences, um, when I first came across this pickup notice about Marianne Waters, it was out of context. It was in a, um, a phenomenal book by C. Riley Snorton called Black on Both Sides, which is a racial history of, um, of trans. And, uh, you know, Snorton just had an image of it and didn't even say what newspaper it was in. And I had to track it down. And as a result, I was also reading all of the material in the Daily National Intelligencer around this ad, sort of like, what was going on in Washington, DC in 1851? Right? <laughs> like, what, is, what is happening? Um, and so it takes us in, it connects us to archives we wouldn't normally we wouldn't necessarily connect to, but then it also becomes a way into archives for other people, right? We have a comment in the chat, which kind of reflects this conversation. It's uh, from one of our, um, it's from someone who works in collect, uh, head of collection management here at Tusk. Um, and she says, Elisa, I work in Tusk and was part of a student group tour where we feature Dean. Uh, students loved it. It's so illustrative of how art and book arts combine. Uh, one student identified himself as a painter and realized that he created an artist book too, but he didn't realize that it was a thing and it was a great moment. <laughs> well, I'm happy. I'm happy to give that student the introduction. <laughs> yeah. That's very nice. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> We have another question um, from Leon Miller. Um, it says, could you talk about how collectors, including museums and galleries, approach your work? For example, there are national and international societies for collectors of miniature books. Are there similar organizations for collectors of artists' books? Hmm. Seems to be primarily academic libraries, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Academic and some museum libraries, but um, but yeah, generally libraries. I'm not aware of any collector groups. There's um, there are some booksellers called uh, Vamp and Tramp who are kind of they're one of the only artist booksellers that I know of that mm -hmm. kind of literally put artist books in a suitcase and go around the the country trying to share them with um, various academic institutions. Right. So, and I know they have a website, if you're curious. Are they based in Brooklyn? I feel yeah. like way. Birmingham. Birmingham. Oh, Birmingham. Birmingham, yeah. There, there used to be a, a Brooklyn book artist collaborative or collective that had, did the same thing. And that was one of my first um, experiences when I worked at the Newberry and Paul Gale, who was the curator at the time, whenever these folks would come into the Newberry and sort of present a bunch of options, he would always bring me in to look at the books with him because he knew I was really interested and was an artist. Um, so I, th I think you're right, Sarah, that there are 
booksellers who special who specialize there's sort of like rare rare book dealers who specialize specifically in artist books mm -hmm. and there may be some private collectors but my experience at least um my experience is only acad only academic institutions have approached me about um marianne waters mm -hmm. there are international um groups of book binders and mm -hmm. other collections but um but yeah as far as offering books yeah someone some people some do specialize vamp and tramp i'm really familiar with i suppose the only other thing would be the college book arts association but mm -hmm. that also is like somewhat semi-academic right uh, yeah up. We have we have time for one more question, I think, and so um, it's from Jillian Coyar. Uh, do you have the first book that you do? You still have the first book that you created, and can you tell us about it? And she also she also says thank you so much. Um, first book I created. Yes, I still have those the first books from that workshop. One of them I just put little snips of um, like ribbon and fabric and ink samples and, and whatnot in that. Um, but my first artist book, I actually don't have. It, it's in a, in a collection, so. Um, I'm having a hard time remembering my first <laughs> artist book, but I know that I still have this piece that I made in college um, that I didn't call a book at the time, but I made this quilt out of used tea bags and I'd printed an erasure text on the, the, the entire thing. And it's been wrapped up in a suitcase in my closet ever since I graduated, so. <laughs> yeah, so similar to um, the little workbooks for my BFA thesis. There was one workbook for every day of the month of March, um, and I still have all 31 <laughs> books in a little Tupperware container somewhere in the closet I wish I had thought and thought ahead and gotten them out of storage and um because it's been a while since i've seen them well thank you all uh so much for joining us today i feel like we could continue this conversation <laughs> and just keep talking about more and more about books um like i said before it's just um really wonderful to be able to see um, the presentations that you gave and see directly from you um the amount of uh creativity and skill and research um, that you've put into your artwork. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today and for giving us this uh, special glimpse into your work um, that we have here. So thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.